What is up guys? Welcome back to another GeekerWatt video and in today's video I'm going to be building an awesome budget gaming PC with this AMD's brand new Ryzen 5 5600G Have AMD saved the day for budget gamers out there with their latest APU releases or simply fallen a little bit short of a dedicated budget GPU like this one? Well, in this video, we're going to find out with detailed performance benchmarks and testing a bit later on. First though, I'm going to show you how to put the system together step by step from start to finish, covering off each of the component choices as we go along. A big shout out to eBuyer for sending out the CPU and making today's video possible. I'll pop their links in the description below. But without any further ado, let's dive into it. Let me kick things off as usual by installing as many components into the motherboard as possible, covering off the storage and the RAM choice as well. For the motherboard though, first of all, I've gone for MSI's MAG B550M Mortar. This board has got a few features we're going to find really useful in today's build specifically. The first is four RAM DIMM slots with support for dual channel memory. Unlike a normal build, our APU doesn't have its own dedicated graphics memory, so it needs to borrow the memory on the motherboard. Having four DIMM slots and dual channel support is really important. We've got support for the latest Gen 4 NVMe SSDs. In fact, we've got two slots for lots of upgradability down the line. We've got a dedicated GPU PCIe slot. This is going to be amazing for adding a dedicated GPU in once prices return to normal, if that's an upgrade path uh, you're looking to exploit. And then finally, around the rear of the board, we've got this built-in IO shield. This is a bit of a cleaner way of doing things, but crucially, it's also got USB-C with 10 gigabit support with two and a half gig ethernet. It's on the higher end as far as B550 boards go, but trust me, it is absolutely worth the cash. To install the CPU into the motherboard, locate the triangle on the top left corner of the socket and just pull the arm up. You want to match this triangle with the corresponding gold triangle on the corner of the CPU. And then it's a really simple case of dropping the chip into place lining up triangle to triangle and returning the arm down. The CPU then is nice and secure and that's pretty much all there is to it. We can move then nicely onto the RAM or the memory. I've got 16 gigabytes of Adata's XPG Gamix D20. Now there's a couple of key things you really must watch out for. You want two RAM DIMMs. Don't go for one RAM DIMM. It really will not go well when you have an APU. You also want 3600 megahertz or quicker 3600 is the ideal speed for price, performance, and all that good stuff. You also want eight gigabyte DIMMs, not really four gig DIMMs, so 16 gigabytes total in a build like this. As remember, the graphics memory and the CPU memory are being shared rather than having its own dedicated GPU memory. Just a few lessons I've learned from my previous uses with AMD APUs. We want to use the second and fourth RAM DIMM slots. This will give us that awesome dual channel performance. So we can do so, slide the memory into place. It really is nice and simple. It's notched, so we'll only go in one way round. But for us, our XPG logos are going to face outwards on the clean side of the RAM. Once that's done then, there's one more component to install into the motherboard. And that is, of course, the storage. This is Seagate's Barracuda 510, one of my favorite Gen 3 NVMe drives. You can learn why in our full review linked in the card section now over on geekawatt.com, but with speeds in the region of about three gigabytes per second, this thing is rapid. The 500 gigabyte drive can be commonly found for a really good price as well. If you want to save a bit of cash, then a SATA SSD will also work well, and I'll put some suggestions down below. For me though, an NVMe drive just future-proofs the build nicely, makes it feel a little bit quicker. I'm going to be installing it into the top M.2 slot here. The process of doing so is super easy. Find the gold strip on the SSD and find particularly the little notch. You're then going to slide this into our M.2 slot before pushing the drive down and screwing it into place with the teeny tiny screw that comes included in the box. Warning for you new builders out there, a regular Phillips head is going to be too big. So you need a teeny tiny screwdriver like this one to install the SSD. It's super easy and these drives are much better to install than SATA drives which need bulky horrible cables. Looking good. Now there is one more thing we need to do to the motherboard before we move it into the case choice for today's build. And that's actually to provide our CPU, the Ryzen 5600G with some cooling. Now one of the biggest advantages of AMD processors is this, the included stock cooler. When it comes to Intel, you do get a stock cooler, but it's frankly not good enough uh, for a build like this one. For us though, this will do the job nicely. 
If you wanted to upgrade the cooler later, you can do, but I think spending $40 on an aftermarket air cooler in this system is a bit of a waste of money. That cash can be better spent upgrading other components elsewhere. Installing the cooler is really easy. It will come with pre-applied thermal paste if it's brand new. Mine isn't, which is why it's missing, with four little screws on each corner. These simply screw into the back plate that comes pre-installed on your motherboard, a little something like this. Uh, tighten up corner by corner, don't tighten them all the way the first time round, do a few different laps, if you will, of the cooler, but otherwise you're good to go. Plug in the fan cable and the motherboard assembly is complete. Which allows us to move it over into the next component choice in this video. And that is, of course, the case. It caught me off guard there, actually, with how heavy it is. This is Cooler Masters MB320L. I featured this in a recent top 10 case video and it is undoubtedly my favourite budget case ever. It comes in two versions, a mesh MB311L and a non-mesh MB320L. This is one of Cooler Master's best cases in some time in my opinion. You get some addressable RGB fans included as standard. You get support for micro ATX motherboards inside with plenty of room for long GPUs as well. Now installing the motherboard's really easy, but before we get all hasty and start screwing it in, we need to take off all of the side panels. Taking off the side panels makes the case that much easier to work with and then we can go ahead and screw the motherboard in. For this step, you're going to want to lay the case down flat and locate each of the standoffs. So we've got three at the top, three along the middle, and three down here at the bottom. You then want to match these up with the standoff holes through the motherboard. So for us, we've got three holes at the top, three holes along the middle, and two at the bottom. Drop the motherboard into place, pop in the IO through the back left of the chassis, and screw it down. Once you've done this, the motherboard is in, and we can move on to, believe it or not, the final component in today's build. Looking good, and that moves us on to the power supply. Now this is Cooler Master's MWE 500. It's a 500 watt 80 plus certified power supply that to be honest with you all is about as cheap as I'd ever go. I wouldn't go for a no brand power supply and I wouldn't go for one without an 80 plus certification. This will do the job well for this build and for any future GPU upgrades within reason. Of course, if you popped in a 3060 Ti or 3070, you would need a more powerful power supply. But for around $50, $55, latest pricing of course can be found at the links below, this will do the job really nicely. The matte black cables also look great and although it's not modular, there aren't too many to tuck away and hide away, so there's no major issues on that front. Screw the power supply in and then plug in the motherboard power cable, the largest of the bunch, followed by the CPU power connector. Of course, no GPU power is needed because we haven't got a graphics card, which moves us on to the next step of the build before we actually test out the performance, which is sorting out all of our drivers and BIOS and getting all of the settings optimal and ready to go to get the most out of our 5600G APU. When it comes to installing Windows and configuring the BIOS settings, there's a few things you need to do. The first is grab a monitor, a keyboard, and a mouse. Get this all connected uh, to the system and then grab yourself a USB 3 stick. Now this USB flash drive is going to be used for installing Windows. You can do this using the free tool linked in the description below. It's an official Microsoft tool and will transform any existing USB into a drive that allows you to install Windows on any computer. Go ahead and plug this in, turn the power switch on the PC on, and then hit delete on your keyboard. Hit and delete will force the motherboard to boot into the BIOS where we can change our key settings and get Windows installed. And just like that, we have made it into the motherboard's BIOS. So when you jump into the BIOS, you can see the key specs we're talking about. You can see the CPU, which is AMD's Ryzen 5 5600G with Radeon graphics, which we'll test shortly. And you can see our memory speed, which currently is not correct. So what we need to do is just jump into memory and actually increase the frequency up to 3600 megahertz. This is really important for a Ryzen processor, especially an APU. In order to do this, we need to jump into advanced mode, which you can access by pressing F7, and then go into the OC or overclock settings. We're going to leave the CPU alone, but enable XMP on profile one. That will then automatically select our speed here at 3600 megahertz for the memory. We then want to take a look at our boot priority, and we want to find our bootable Windows USB stick, and just push this right to the front. You can then hit F10 to save and exit. It will show you all the changes you've made, including uh, the memory speed change, which is right here at the bottom under XMP, and then we can click yes, and that will automatically boot us into the Windows USB, which we'll use to install Windows 10. 
So we're going to just select all of our languages and input methods and hit install now. You then want to go ahead and select I don't have a product key or if you do of course enter the product key you do have and then select Windows 10 Home. After accepting the terms and conditions, we want to install Windows only, and then go ahead and select the drive we want to install Windows on. So for us, we've only got the singular 500 gigabyte Seagate drive. If you've got lots of different drives, it might be a good idea to unplug or disconnect the ones you don't want to use, especially if they're the same capacity and it's too difficult to differentiate which drive is which. Once you've done this, the next process of the setup is going to take a little bit of time. So I'll leave this for 10 minutes and come back to you then. And there we have it. We're now into Windows and it's automatically found some basic display drivers to run at the full 1440p resolution. If we just jump into Task Manager quickly and just uh, check our memory speed, you'll be able to see here that we are indeed running at 3600 megahertz. It's that little number there we want to focus on with 16 gigs of memory and of course uh, a Ryzen 5 5600G. You then want to uh, install Google Chrome because Microsoft Edge is frankly awful and search for MSI B550M Mortar drivers. There aren't that many drivers to install to be honest with you for today's video, but some basic CPU graphics drivers are always a good idea. You can do this by heading to the drivers tab, go ahead and select the operating system. So for us it's Windows 10 64 and then you want to jump to your system and chipset drivers and your onboard VGA drivers. These are the two really important ones you need to download and they will take your performance literally up a notch. So make sure you get the graphics and the basic chipset drivers and go ahead and install those. Of course, with no dedicated GPU, we've got no AMD Radeon or Nvidia GeForce Experience. So any other utilities listed that take your fancy are worth an install. But these are the two key ones to get you rocking, rolling and ready to go. That allows us then to test out the performance of this system. But before we do that, we need to do something that we do here on the GeekerWork channel week in, week out. It is, of course, an epic montage of just how good the machine looks when it's all powered up. I'll see you in a second for the benchmarks, but first, roll that montage. <laughs> Nice one. This is a good looking system that despite its budget price tag wouldn't look out of place in most gaming setups. But does it have the performance to match the aesthetic? Let's find out. GTA 5 as ever is the first game we tested out and here at 1080p normal slash medium settings we got 71 FPS on average. All of our frame rates were measured using both MSI Afterburners Revatuner and Nvidia FrameView. Considering that GTA 5, despite its age, is still quite a demanding game, to get these sort of numbers on an APU is an amazing start. Next up then, and the second title we tested out was Fortnite. At 1080p competitive settings, so everything tuned down to low, render distance set to far, we got 72 frames per second on average. Not a bad result then in Fortnite, a game which I'm sure a lot of 5600G prospective buyers will be looking at the performance of. Moving on to Overwatch, and here at 1080p with our settings tuned down, we got 68 frames per second. The 5600G really is made for these esports titles and allows you to get a real good in to budget gaming without of course getting that 100 frames per second at 1080p high. It's all about what titles you want to play and managing those expectations. CSGO gave us some pretty good results. 1080p high gave us 90 frames per second on average, more than enough to be competitive on a 60Hz monitor, which is the important punchline of the 5600G, while strong 90 and 99th percentile results gave us consistent results in Counter-Strike. Rainbow Six Siege was also pretty decent. 1080p between medium and low uh, using the game's inbuilt benchmarking mode yielded 58 FPS. So essentially 60 frames per second in Rainbow Six where visually the game looked more than good enough. We also tested out a little bit of Call of Duty, both Black Ops Cold War, the Zombies mode and Call of Duty Warzone. Unfortunately, 1080p was a little bit too far for this super budget system if you want to get in excess of 60 FPS. 720p though, in Black Ops Cold War, of course, more of a AAA title than a game designed for this APU, gave us 66 frames per second on average. Very, very playable and not a terrible result by any means. Thankfully, Valorant, which we also tested, gave us some great results. 1080p normal medium settings uh, saw us achieve 170 frames per second on average, showing once again that this machine kills it with those slightly older or easier to run esports titles. Finally then, the last game is Apex Legends. 
Here at 720p low settings or competitive settings, so everything tuned down, but any render distance set up a little bit, here we got 80 frames per second. I'm sure at 1080p you could still achieve 30 to 40 in Apex, but I think actually you'd rather take the slight resolution sacrifice and get that higher frame rate. All in all, we've actually been pretty impressed by the 5600G. I think it's definitely worth considering a GT 1030 or something like a 1650, though we'll be doing a dedicated deep dive comparison between those cards as so you guys can make the best informed buying decision. Either way, the chip is a strong CPU with 6 cores and 12 threads and provides the best graphics integrated into a processor we've ever seen. Of course, a dedicated GPU that costs $300, which is more than the price total of this CPU and GPU combo, is going to provide you better results. But for this build, for esports titles, we were very impressed. And of course, you can buy them right now. If you'd like to do so or learn more about any of the components today, check out the links in the description below. Thanks for tuning in though, and as always, we'll see you in the next one.